This video is part of a series where we build an entire FPV drone from start to finish. So if it feels like you're in the middle of a conversation that you missed the start of, that's why. If you're here for the information in this specific video, keep watching. But if you want to find out the full context for what's going on here, there's a link in the video description to the full playlist, and you might need to go back and start with video number one. In this video, we're going to be installing the Walksnail video transmitter and camera in the quad. If you are not using Walksnail, you're using DJI or analog, then you're welcome to watch this video, but you won't be doing any of the steps that are in it. And the first thing I want to do is route this camera cable. So the video transmitter is going to go in the back of the quadcopter. The camera connector is right here. That's where it's going to plug in and it's going to mount something like this. And uh, it might seem really obvious that, well, you just kind of lay the cable like this, but I don't like the cable to go over the top of the flight controller. And the reason for that is that when the top plate is on, there is not a lot of clearance between the flight controller and the top plate. And uh, we're going to need to run a battery strap through there. We're constantly going to be handling the battery strap as we put the battery on and off. And so I don't like cables to run over the top there where they can kind of be in the way. So instead, I'm going to fish this underneath the ESC. I should be able to just fish that through. And you can see that there is plenty of room down there for that cable to go without getting snagged or caught on anything. Yeah. With that done, we're going to plug this connector into the video transmitter. This connector is called a MIPI connector, M-I-P-I. And it is a very small connector. It's not super delicate, but it's a little delicate if you like try to push it on and plug it in wrong then so don't like just be a little ginger and make sure it's lined up right before you actually press on it to plug it in it shouldn't take that much force so we've got this side of the connector is going to go down this side is going to go up and it will just kind of line up on here and you'll feel it kind of slot into place when it's lined up right and then you can just push it down the rest of the way There we go. And it should just lock in like that. Once that's done, we're going to get these screws and nuts. They come in a little bag that comes with the video transmitter. Here is the antenna for the Walksnail video transmitter. We're going to get that out and we are going to press that into this 3D printed mount that should have been supplied for you if you bought the digital version of this kit. It just friction fits down in there like so. And then with a 1.5 millimeter driver, we're gonna remove these two screws and remove the retaining bar. Okay, so well, you might wanna do the antenna before you mount the video transmitter because these nuts are gonna fall out. Uh, they can, they are accessible. Let's see if I can do this. This connector right here is referred to as a UFL connector. A, what you wanna do is just kind of get it lined up roughly about centered and then kind of give it a little downward pressure and a little bit of a wiggle. And it should pop down into place. There we go. Uh, if you ever need to remove one, just come from underneath Press up on the brass part, try not to pull on the cable, and just kind of lever it up and it'll pop off. I get to suffer for not having thought ahead. And come on, come on, baby. Once that's done, we're gonna get these screws and nuts. They come in a little bag that comes with the video transmitter. The only concern that I slightly have is that these holes in the frame are drilled for M3, but these are M2 screws. I don't think that the head is gonna be able to pull through. And there's not a lot of thread to grab on. So I am, in this case, gonna use a little bit of Loctite, blue Loctite to make sure that this stays secure. But I'm gonna use these screws instead of the double-sided tape. I mean, why not? So I also noticed that there's mounting lugs on both sides, um, but it's important that we mount it this side up. And the reason being that this is gonna to need to be removed to install the antennas. Uh, and so we will want access to that once this is mounted. Oh my goodness. That is so nice. That is really nice and secure. Uh, that's really good. Walksnail. The only video transmitter that included mounting hardware with your kit. Good job, Walksnail.
Next, we gotta connect this to the flight controller, and we're gonna do that using this cable that comes with the video transmitter. You can see that the video transmitter does have solder pads if you prefer to direct solder, but I like to use this cable. I desperately wish that Walksnail would start shipping their video transmitters with a DJI compatible cable so you could simply plug into the DJI plug on the side of the flight controller. Many flight controllers have DJI compatible plugs because DJI is 500 pound gorilla in this industry and um, the Walksnail could use it, but they don't. So we are gonna have to solder. Thankfully, Walksnail have labeled the wires coming out of the video transmitter, so we don't have to go online and search for a manual to find out what they are. And they are VCC and ground. So VCC is another name for the supply voltage. So we've, we've talked about VBAT in the past, which is battery voltage. And then we might have five volt, nine volt, 10 volt, 12 volt coming out of a regulator somewhere on the flight controller. Uh, VCC just means whatever voltage I expect to have. And in this case, we would need to go to the product page to know that the acceptable voltage range for this is, I think it's seven to 26 volts. So basically we can choose to run this off of our battery voltage, which is uh, 6S. So that's gonna max out at 25 volts. That's a topic for another video. We're probably gonna run this off the 10 volt voltage regulator on the flight controller. And the reason that we're gonna choose to do that is that a voltage regulator will filter and clean the power, whereas the battery voltage is often pretty noisy because the motors make a ton of electrical noise. And so generally it's better to run a video transmitter off a voltage regulator if you have the option to do it most of the time. The other two wires are TX and RX. That stands for transmit and receive. And whenever you see TX and RX on a peripheral, that is telling you that it needs to connect to a UART on the flight controller. UART stands for, the, it's U-A-R-T. It said UART and it stands for a, a long something. Nobody ever says the full name of it. They all just say UART. So don't worry about what it stands for. It's not important. A UART is basically like a, USB port on your computer. Like you have a USB port on your computer, you plug your mouse in, you plug your headphones in or whatever. You plug per your keyboard, you plug peripherals that the computer needs to talk to. It's a really poor analogy if you know about USB and UART, but it, it'll do for now. UART is used to connect the flight controller to things that it needs to talk to, like a video transmitter, like your receiver when we wire that up. Any kind of digital data communication is gonna be done through a UART. So what we need to do is decide which UART on the flight controller we are going to connect the video transmitter to. And if we were to use this little plug here, that is for the DJI video transmitter. That plug actually has the connections for a UART in it, but we're not gonna be able to do that. We're gonna need to look at the pads on top of the flight controller and find a TX and an RX pad that we can connect to. And it turns out there are only really two choices here. We've got TX3 and RX3 right over here, and you can barely read the labels, but TX4 and RX4 right over here. The flight controller actually has more UARTs that it's using for other things, but they're not available in convenient solder pads on top of the flight controller for us to solder to. And in this case, we're gonna use TX3 and RX3 for the video transmitter. We could use either of them, but I happen to know that TX3 and RX3 are also inside this plug. Uh, and so they're sort of intended for use with the video transmitter. And we're just gonna kind of go with the design intent of the board in that case. The next thing you need to know about UARTs is that TX on the peripheral device goes to RX on the flight controller. And this seems a little bit backward. Like when you're wiring up power, ground on the device goes to ground on the flight controller. Five volts on the device goes to five volts on the flight controller. Usually you connect the same thing to the same thing and then they talk, but UARTs don't work like that. Think of it like if we're playing catch. I throw the ball, you catch the ball. I transmit, you receive. T I I I T X U R X. So when we wire them up, we're gonna make note of which wire is TX and which wire is RX, and we're gonna flip them when we solder them to the flight controller. There's a convention that I like to use when I solder things up. I'm gonna tell you about it. It's really dumb, but some of you are gonna love it. The convention that I use is that the color white, white has a T in it. 
white wire goes to TX on the flight controller. And then when I'm w wiring stuff up, any color that has an R in it, like gray, orange, green, or, well, blue and yellow, I just don't fit into this convention. Any color that has a R in it goes to RX on the flight controller. Now, in this case, we don't really have a choice because this connector is pre-wired for us. If we were cutting our own lengths of wire and soldering to these solder pads, we could choose the colors and then we could have that as a convention to help make sure we do it right. In this case though, we've lucked out because the white wire, look at the order, TX, RX, ground, VCC. So this wire is the TX wire, it's the gray wire. TX on the video transmitter is gonna to go to RX on the flight controller. In this case, thank you, Walksnail, you've done what my convention expects. I don't have to go look back and forth, remind myself which wire was TX, which wire was RX. I just remember the white wire is gonna to go to EX on the flight controller, the gray wire is gonna to go to RRX on the flight controller. Okay, let's, let's do it, enough talking. Here's what the final wiring should look like, and you'll notice my TX and RX wires are where I said they were gonna be, but I didn't use the power and ground pad that are adjacent to them, and that's a little bit weird, just it keeps the wiring neat to keep everything sort of going to the same place on the board. The reason that I did that is that this power pad is labeled five volts. It only outputs five volts, and this video transmitter needs a minimum of seven volts, so that's not gonna work. Uh, instead, we're gonna wire the power and ground to the power and ground pads over here. This is the plug header for an analog video transmitter and that power pad, which it's a little annoying that it's just labeled power. Like, what does that even mean? It turns out that the power pad is uh, a 10 volt regulator that's on board the flight controller and it'll provide 10 volts for this video transmitter, which is within the seven to 26 volt acceptable range that, that the manufacturer states. I, how do I know that? Well, I tested it with a multimeter in a different video one of the other VTX installation videos that, anyway. They should just label it 10 volt, right? Yes, trust me. The other thing I want you to see is that I have soldered these wires going inward toward the center of the board. If the wire was going out somewhere, like if we're soldering to a device that's up here in the front of the quad, we would do the wires outward. Uh, but since this wire is going into the center of the board, and over to the VTX, then that's how I prefer to do it. I did say earlier in this video that I don't like wires going over the top of the flight controller, and I specifically ran the camera wire underneath the ESC to avoid that. If I really wanted to be sort of ideologically consistent, I would wire these going outwards, I would fold them under the flight controller, and then I would twist it and have it come out, like right here in between the FC and the ESC. I'm not gonna do that. Cause, uh, just cause, cause I don't want to. But mostly what I'm trying to avoid is having like a U-turn, having the wire come off the solder joint and immediately fold back around. That'll stress the wire and could end up with it breaking or in the, coming off in the future. So here we go. We've just got enough twists that the wire has some sort of tension in it and will sort of stay in place. And I like that. That's gonna stay nice and neat and out of the way. Next thing we need to do is update the firmware on the video transmitter and the goggles and configure the flight controller to work with the video transmitter. To update the firmware on the video transmitter, we're gonna need this little USB adapter. The video transmitter doesn't have a full-size USB port on it. It's kind of annoying, but I guess they're trying to keep it small and light. Depending on what video transmitter you have, you might get a plug kind of like this with just a USB port on it or one like this this, which looks the same, but actually has a slightly different plug. Whatever plug you get is gonna be compatible with whatever video transmitter you get, but confusingly, Walksnail uses different size plugs on different video transmitters, so don't just assume that this one that you got with your video transmitter is gonna work with all the other Walksnail video transmitters. It's pretty frustrating, and I wish they would standardize on one plug size and one USB. I wish they'd put a freaking USB plug on their VTX, but especially on the little tiny micro ones for small quads, that's just not an option. A anyway, enough bitching. The USB adapter is gonna plug into this plug on the side of the video transmitter. Be very careful when plugging it in. If you plug it in slightly crooked and j try to jam it in with your finger, you can very easily damage it. Uh, so be careful, make sure it's lined up right, make sure it's the right side up, and then carefully plug it in. 
And I suppose we can go ahead and plug in USB, although nothing will happen until we plug a battery in. Next, I'm gonna refer you to this site, avatarfirmware.d3vl.com. D3vl stands for Devil, and Devil is a developer who's done, it's not important. Devil is a, a guy who maintains an archive of the Walksnail firmware, and I always go to his page to download them because I find it easier than the official Walksnail page. It's really easy to find older firmware versions and to keep track of the release notes, and it's just a nicer experience overall than going to Walksnail's page. What I'm gonna recommend we do is download the latest release version. So this 33.39.10 is a beta. I'm gonna suggest that we skip that one, and we're gonna download 32.37.10, uh, or whatever is the latest official release at the time that you are watching this. And then we're gonna need to download two things. One is we're gonna need to download the Sky firmware, which is for the video transmitter, which is up in the sky, right? That makes sense, that's what they call it. And then we're gonna need to download the firmware for our goggles. In my case, I have the Avatar HD goggles, but if you have the standalone video receiver or the Fat Shark Recon HD, you're gonna download that firmware. Next, we're gonna get an SD card. I'm not sure if it needs to be formatted as FAT32 or whatever, but just to be safe, we're gonna take that SD card, we're gonna right click and format, and format it as FAT32. If it is larger than like two, two gig, you won't be able to use FAT32, and I suggest you get a smaller card. Sometimes devices have a hard time reading cards that are not formatted FAT32. Next, I'm gonna take the avatar ground file for my goggles, whatever the file was that you downloaded for your goggles, and I'm gonna drag that over to the SD card. We're gonna take that SD card and we're going to insert it into our goggles. And we're gonna power up our goggles. Now while your goggles are powering up, take a look at the battery that you're using to power them and check to see if it is topped off. If the battery dies during the firmware update process, well, you won't break your goggles. They fixed that issue. Yeah, see, my voltage is super low. My goggles are even warning me. <laughs> they won't break your goggles if you power off during the firmware update unless you have a super, super old firmware that you probably don't have, but it's still a good idea not to tempt fate. Once your goggles are fully powered up, you're gonna hold down the bind button for about seven to 10 seconds until the goggles begin beeping. Okay. At this point, you should see the splash screen inside the goggles it says Avatar HD system, and then the goggles will begin beeping. If the goggles begin beeping like this, beep, beep, a slow beep, that means the firmware update is in process. You just wait. It may take as much as five or 10 minutes for it to finish, just wait it out. If the goggles start beeping fast, like beep, 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 it means that something is wrong, that they can't read the SD card, you've put the wrong file on the SD card, or something like that, it means the firmware update is not proceeding, and you need to power, power the goggles off and figure out why they're not updating. Okay, well, <laughs> while that's going on, we'll go ahead and do the video transmitter. The way we're going to do that is we're going to power up the quadcopter, and we should see the LED on the video transmitter come on. And we should see a new USB drive pop up on our computer. Okay, so uh, blinking LED on the video transmitter and new USB drive appeared on our computer. That USB drive is the USB of the video transmitter and we're gonna take the sky file and we're gonna drop it on that USB drive to copy it over to the video transmitter. Then we're gonna hold the button down on the video transmitter for about seven seconds until the LED goes off and the USB drive disappears. The update of the video transmitter only takes a few seconds. I have no idea why it's so fast and the goggles are so slow, but it is. And as soon as the light comes back on, we will be done. Okay. I'm gonna unplug the video transmitter now that the light has come back on. It's just solid red. I'm gonna unplug it so it doesn't get too hot. And when my goggles have finished updating, we'll go ahead and bind them. Oh, 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 there it is. That's the sound that means the firmware update is done. It goes beep. And then it should be rebooting. It is, it's rebooting. Now we're gonna bind the goggles to the video transmitter. It's really simple. On the goggles, we're just gonna press the bind button once. They will begin beeping. 
We're going to power up the video transmitter by plugging in a battery. When the LED on the video transmitter comes on and begins blinking like this, we're going to press the bind button one time. The LED will go solid red. I said the LED will go solid red. And then we've got a firmware versions do not match as well as... Well, well, it should match. Let me do this check. Device info, 323710. The transmitter is 3339.8. Oh. Oh, well, that's very interesting. How does the video transmitter have 333910 on it? That's the latest possible firmware, the beta firmware. How did this video transmitter come out of the box with beta firmware on it? That confuses the shit out of me. But it does explain what why the firmware di update didn't work. Um, Walksnail has a, a feature that prevents you from rolling the firmware back to an earlier version. So 3339.8 is on there. I tried to flash 3237.10, which is an older firmware, and then therefore it didn't take. My goggles are on 3237.10 because I don't want to be on a beta firmware just yet because there are some issues with it. I, uh, okay, I don't want to take up a whole bunch of your time trying to sort this out. Suffice it to say, you would like to have them on the same firmware. If your video transmitter comes with 3339.10, I guess you're going to need to update your goggles to 3339.10 as well. Although probably by the time you're reading this, there will be another official firmware that will actually be what you will uh, uh, flash to. But there's one other problem we've run into actually. And the problem is that clearly the goggles are bound and everything's working, but we have no image. Oh, 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 oh no. I was about to say, is my camera disconnected? Wait, no, I have my lens cap on. Hold on. Oh, everything is fine. I was about to think I messed up the plugging the camera into the video transmitter. No, I just had the lens cap on. Yay. The next thing I want you to see is do you see in the lower right hand corner, it says 10 volts and it's red. What that's telling us is that the voltage that the video transmitter is getting is too low, but hang on, no it's not. I told you earlier that the acceptable voltage range for the Walksnail video transmitter is seven to 26 volts. 10 volts is well within that range, so why is it red? That is actually the voltage that it thinks the quadcopter is at. And if this was a quadcopter battery, 10 volts might be too low. So when you see that red 10.1 volts down there in the lower left, just ignore it. It doesn't mean anything. Next, we're gonna set up the flight controller to work with the on-screen display in the goggles, but I can't help but notice that my video transmitter's overheating. So I'm gonna get this little USB powered fan and it's gonna blow on the video transmitter and cool it down. I apologize for the small amount of sound that's gonna make, but uh, we're going to need to do that to keep the video transmitter from overheating. I want you to take a look at this right here. Do you see the like, no SD card, 14.6 gig, down here at the bottom, channel 6. These OSD elements here are part of the Walksnail system, and the Walksnail goggles are drawing them and telling you about the Walksnail system, like how much space there is on the SD card in the goggles. These OSD elements here like RSSI, DBM, and so forth, that is actually coming from the flight controller. And you probably don't have those because the only reason these are here is because I used the same flight controller to set up the DJI video transmitter for the previous video. So hold on. <laughs> I just didn't want them to disappear suddenly without you knowing why. But what you should see is actually this. No uh, on-screen display coming from the flight controller. And we totally want an on-screen display from the flight controller. Imagine like that you had a car, but like the odometer and the gas gauge didn't work. Could you see how that would be a problem? I, I say that and yet I have friends whose cars, the gas gauge doesn't work and they just, well, they use the odometer. They know that they need to fill up every so many hundred miles, right? If both the odometer and the gas gauge didn't work, you'd probably run out of battery. And that's a very rough explanation for why you absolutely want the on-screen display. The information it gives you is essential. Um, in order to do that, we are gonna need to configure the flight controller to communicate certain information to the video transmitter. And in order to do that, 
we are going to need Betaflight Configurator. So Betaflight is the firmware that runs on the flight controller and Betaflight Configurator is what we use to configure the flight controller. If at this point you have previously downloaded and installed Betaflight Configurator, good. If not, this is gonna be one of the things that I'm gonna actually refer you to another video on because I have another video that perfectly explains how to get Betaflight downloaded and installed and I kinda of don't wanna put that stuff, just reproduce that content in this video. So if you've never downloaded and installed Betaflight Configurator, pause the video here, go down to the link in the video description, get Betaflight installed, get your drivers sorted out, anything you need to do based on that video and then come on back here and we will pick up where we left off. Okay, so now you've got Betaflight Configurator installed. We're gonna plug USB into the flight controller, and when we do that, I want you to take a look up here in the upper right of the configurator. When I do that, a new a serial port will appear. See, COM3 appeared, that's the one we're gonna select, and we're gonna hit connect, and we're gonna connect to the flight controller. It's gonna give us some error messages. Don't worry, we'll fix those later. For now, we're just gonna close that. And what we need to do is we need to go to the presets tab, and we need to, there's just a preset you can load that does all the configuration for the video transmitter without us having to do each of the individual steps. And the preset we're looking for is avatar, Start typing the word avatar in this search box and you will find OSD for FPV WTF DJI 3 Avatar HD. That's the one you want. So we're gonna go ahead and click that and then we wanna open up these options and we wanna make sure that the map to display port and set HD OSD options are on. Just take my word for that now, we want that. And then we also need to tell the flight controller what UART number we put the video transmitter on. Do you remember that we soldered the gray and the white wire to TX3 and RX3? That's UART3. So we're gonna select UART3 here and then we're gonna hit pick and then we're gonna hit save and reboot. Having done that, we can go to the OSD tab. And what I want you to do is just pick an OSD element like battery voltage. And I'm gonna click this leftmost uh, tick box and battery voltage will appear on screen. And then if we go over to our goggles, we should see battery voltage on screen. And if I drag that to a new location on screen, like let's just put that all the way in the upper left-hand corner. We should see that it goes to the upper left-hand corner in our goggles, except it didn't, did it? That 22.2 volts that you see up there is not in the upper left-hand most corner of our goggle screen. It is sort of in the middle of the screen. Here's the reason for that. What we need to do is go into the goggle menu and choose settings, display, and then OSD position. And what I want you to do is use the joystick to move this red box up and left all the way until it is all the way in the upper left hand corner of the screen. Great, but there's another problem we're gonna solve. Watch, if I move this all the way down to the lower right hand corner of the screen, can you guess whether it's gonna be in the lower right hand corner of our goggles? Oh, you win a million dollars. It's not, a, it's not. The, here's how we fix that. What we're gonna do is first of all, hit save just to save our OSD layout. We'll come back to this. We're gonna to go to the CLI tab. We're gonna click in the text box right here and I'm gonna paste in these lines and hit enter. And you can find these lines down in the video description below so you don't have to try to type them in manually. Just copy paste them from the video description. Your screen should look like this. Then I'm gonna go down to the text box and type the word save. And then if I reconnect and go back to the OSD tab, what you should see is that now the layout of the OSD tab, the sort of size and shape actually matches what my goggles have. So if you take a look at where the voltage is here in the OSD tab, that actually corresponds with where the voltage is in the actual camera. So now if we drag this all the way to the lower right hand corner, it appears all the way in the lower right hand corner. Actually, well, we kind of may not want that because it overlaps with the channel readout. So maybe I'll just move this up a couple of clicks and then let's see how that looks. Oh, that looks really good. Okay. Now you can, at this point, tweak your OSD all you want and drag things wherever you want them and play with that. That's something you can do on your own time. But I'm gonna give you my preferred OSD setup. I've got all of this stuff and I'm gonna put it down in the video description below and I'm gonna copy it. You could copy it from the video description. I'm gonna go to Betaflight Configurator, go to the CLI tab 
and paste it in and hit enter and type the word save. And now this is what the OSD looks like in Betaflight Configurator. And uh, this is what it looks like in the Walksnail system. And this is actually what I use as my personal OSD. You can copy it, you could not, it's up to you. Whatever you do though, absolutely you need battery voltage turned on at the very least so you can monitor your battery voltage. We'll talk more about that. Well, that might even be just a topic for a whole nother video series, but you definitely would be like driving without your gas gauge. You won't know when your tank's about to be empty. And unlike your gas tank, when you run a battery empty, you destroy it. Well, your gas tank, you're sad because you got to go get some gas, but at least you put the gas back in the car and everything's fine. There's one more thing that I just remembered that you need to do, and I, I forgot about it because you only ever need to do it once, and I did it a long time ago. But if you have got your goggles for the very first time, they're brand new, then when you go into the channel, for example, do you see uh, seven channels and then a CHP, a public channel, or do you only see three channels there? If you go to settings and go down to bitrate, do you have the option to select high bitrate as well as standard, or do you only have standard? If you don't have those options, then it means you need to unlock your goggles. Here's how you do it. First, you're gonna need to go to this Google Drive link which I will put down in the video description below and download this zip file. Then you're gonna take the avatar underscore PWR and avatar underscore STD file, and you're gonna copy them to your goggles SD card. After that, you're gonna put the SD card back in the goggles and power cycle the goggles. And when you do that, you should have access to all eight channels. You should have a high bit rate mode available and you should have access to power levels, 1000 and 1200 milliwatts. Uh, and that will confirm that the goggles are fully unlocked and enabled. Next up, we need to install the camera in the frame. And to do that, I want you to grab this bag of hardware that came with the camera. And I want you to specifically get the very smallest screws that came there. Uh, we're gonna need four of them, actually. The reason there's different lengths of screws is that different frames have thicker or thinner side plates that the camera has to mount to, and the screws, if the screws go too far into the camera, then they'll damage the electronics inside. So we need a length of screw that is like gonna extend out past the side plate by just a, a, the right amount. Speaking of side plates, here are the two side plates. And what I want you to see is that they have a top and a bottom. So this is the top right here and this is the bottom. Notice the direction it sort of swooshes backwards and notice the orientation of these little cutouts here. And there's a left and a right. Uh, you can identify the left and the right because the flat side goes on the inside and the little indented side goes on the outside. Uh, the last thing we have to figure out is where to mount the camera. And the reason that there are multiple choices of where to mount the camera is that we want the camera to be protected from impact by the side plate, right? That's sort of the whole point. We can't protect the camera entirely. Like if we were to put the camera so far back in that it was completely protected, then you can see that the side plate would interfere with the view of the camera. You wouldn't be able to see where you were going. So we want the camera to be just about perfectly placed front to back and different cameras have different dimensions. But in this case, this camera has two mounting holes. Some cameras only have a single screw. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start here. We're gonna start with this screw hole here and we're gonna make sure that the camera is right side up. The wire comes out the bottom and we're gonna screw that into the top screw hole loosely. And what you should see is that the bottom screw hole then lines up with this arc. And what that's gonna let us do is it's gonna let us set the amount of up tilt on the camera. We will talk about camera up tilt in a later video, so don't stress about it now, but just loosely put in those four screws to the two side plates. When we're done, we will have an assembly that looks something like this. And then these tabs on the bottom of the camera plates go in these slots on the front of the frame. Uh, mine are a little snug. I'm not sure if that's intentional or if that's just because I have a prototype and maybe the tolerances aren't quite how they're gonna be on the final uh, quad, uh, but I have to kind of work them in a little bit with some force. Yours may or may not go in smoothly.
The other thing I think you should consider doing is, and you can see I've done this accidentally, but I kind of meant to do it on purpose. Give your camera like one twist to take the slack out of this cable. This cable is a little too long and just giving the camera a single twist so that it makes a little spiral will help keep it inside the frame and from getting chopped or damaged. Then the last thing to do in your frame kit, you'll find some small screws like that and they're gonna go in these two screw holes and they will screw and hold the camera plates in place. And here is where we should be at. Actually, I'm not so sure about that. Hi there, it's Joshua from the future, and as you can see, I have finished building this quadcopter. You're gonna meet me soon. Uh, I'm not convinced that it is installed in the most optimal way. Look, look how far it sticks out. That's further than is ideal. So, hold on. I wonder, I wonder if we should use the rear. Yes. This rear diagonal slit is actually going to be just right. It's going to line it up just perfectly with the front. Hmm. Well, that's why we designed it this way. Uh, unfortunately, if we do use the rear diagonal slit, we will not be able to use the second set of screw holes. We'll only be able to use one screw hole in the camera. Uh, and so because of that, I suppose it would probably be prudent to go ahead and use Loctite on this. And it seems to me like the most precise placement of the camera relative to the front end is achieved by using the top screw hole of the camera moved to the top of this slit, which pushes the camera just a little further back. If you need to though, you can actually slide the camera down a little bit in this slit and that moves it forward a little. You can fine tune that as you like. Only having one screw means that the camera may be slightly more likely to like change angle in a crash. But if you tighten it down, it should hold in place pretty well. And it does mean that it's easier just to kind of use your fingers to tweak it if you need to. Nope, I've flown it. And the first time it crashed, the camera went just doink and fell down. So uh, what I've done now is I have moved the screws to the bottom hole of the camera, uh, hoping that will move the fulcrum closer to the center of gravity of the camera and give the camera lens less leverage to pull it down. And I have gone to the second largest screw in the batch of screws that, or the second smallest. I was on the smallest screw that came with the camera. Now I'm on the second smallest screw and I've added two of the washers that the camera comes with in hopes that will give a little more friction. I am. I'm not sure if this is going to be the final answer to this problem, but it's going to be the final answer that we get today. And this whole hobby is just a process of experiencing problems and finding ways to solve them while occasionally getting to enjoy flying a quadcopter. And so that is the final, what you're actually going to walk away from this having learned. In this video, we installed the Walksnail video transmitter and camera in the frame. We connected them to the flight controller. We bound and updated the firmware on the Walksnail system. And we set up the on-screen display so that we have full functionality of that with the flight controller. That's going to do it for this video. I will see you in the next one where we will, I think we're going to set the receiver up next. Oof. I'll see you there. Playlist down in the video description. Card on screen if you can see cards on your uh, platform that you're watching on now. I'll see you there.